In 1866, Charles Woolley was commissioned to photograph some of the remaining Aborigines living at the old Oyster Cove Convict Station. And my seamate, William Lanny, was one of them. He got a lift in a cart with the others up over that right hole of a road on Bonadil and arrived at Woolley's photographic rooms in the town. Woolley set up his large plate box camera and began the process. His name was Lanny, or William, or Will. This is his image. He lives in the shadows now, waiting to tell his story to some passerby. For that's what he's left with, an earnest desire to communicate with another soul. With respect, I ask you to take a moment to hear his tale. I know it because I was his friend and heard all about it. He was born in the east of the island in the English year of 1835. His country, a precious memory. But before his heart could get caught up with dreams of life with his family in that wonderful world, they moved to the West Country away from the terror that had taken hold of his people as the English pushed into their lands. They travelled through the country up into the high places. William's family burning grassland as they always did. No one was left there of his people to look after the land by now. But the animals and such would get the benefit of new growth. They met up with the ragtag mob of his people from all over the island. All of them ate from the sea, and when the tucker birds arrived, they ate from them. It made his heart happy and pushed away sadness. A bloke named Robinson came up from the south. He was gathering the last of them black folk up to move to some place away from white people. But he missed Lanny's mob. Then, in 1842, they were sprung by some white sealers who collected a bounty of 50 English pounds to turn him in. No safe place for Lanny though. Instead, they was put on a boat and ended up at a camp on an island far away from their world. Why Balena? His ma, his da and his brothers in that god rot junk. What a sad turnout, eh? What a heap of curses. There were times in that hole when he despaired of his life. Life in this one were all but the death of him. And it was too much for many, including all his family who died. People went mad, slipping away with sadness. He kept saying, talking to himself. He had dreams of getting away, making a raft or something, and sailing home to his land. But nothing ever turned out that way. So many people died. The government dragged the last of his lot from Wybalena down to the convict station at Oyster Cove, Putalina. Not long after, Lanny was taken off and stuck in the orphan school to civilise him. They kept a tight lid on that place. 
It was too tight for Will. He slipped out one sold dark night and never went back. The 1850s in Hobart town was a shocker time. For those scratching a life at the bottom end of town, you never saw the like of it. Shit and piss, smell and grime. Couldn't see a sparrow's fart from here to there on account of the smoke and the dirt. Coughing country. And not much later, coffin country. Die coffin or die of straight sadness. But, you know, Lanny felt for all our white folk. Convicts, mostly. Bundled off here to the arse end of their empire. Men, women and children. If they got out into the country to work, they might have done okay. But here in the town, hope runs off and trouble sticks. Lost in this place, away from their world, in Lanny's, with no soul for the land. Lucky for Will, though, he met up with us sailing blokes and got a job on our whaling boat. We sailed out of the river into a heaving gale in Storm Bay. What a turn. I don't know you can imagine what batten down below decks in one of them stinking god boats is like beating a hole in the chaos of water and spew. But Lanny did all right. He made friends with us shipmates and that well. And we put him up in our homes when we was in port. In 1866, William's Aboriginal friends and he got their images captured again by some other bloke with a box camera. Seemed like everyone wanted to take their pictures, all of them dressed up as if they was toffs, especially their women folk, bows in their hair and such. Can you credit it? You'll note his sad face, but don't be too worried. He did okay, really, compared to some. But he had no glimmer of what was to come. The strange things people will get into their heads. English scientists in the 1860s believed humans developed from the apes in different ways around the world. And some humans were left way behind back with the apes, while others became the brightest. They said the English and Germans were at the top of the pile while the Aboriginal Tasmanians were at the bottom. All this worked out by the measuring of skulls, such that they had a list showing who was the brightest. That's what urged them on to dig up Aboriginal bones, a price on their heads, their burials broken open, money passing hands, their bones smuggled off to London. And when they had no more bones to find, they hoped for William's lonely people to die so their bones could be sent off as well. Back on board my ship, Lanny heard rumours. Our seamates had caught whispers in dockside ale shops. The wind moaned and the sea slapped. William imagined the hands of this English headman named Carruther, they told of, creeping across the bilge after his skull. Lanny fell ill at sea and ended up in Hobart in a pub. A seamate arranged for him to see a doctor, but he didn't make it. News spread of his passing and the squabble over his bones began. His body was taken to the dead house. Mr. Crowther, a surgeon at the hospital, 
asked Governor Dry for Lanny's body. The governor refused. So bent on getting Lanny's head, Crowther and his son slipped into the dead house at night. They cut Will's skull out from under his face and replaced it with the skull they removed from a dead teacher next door. When the hospital director, Stokel, figured out the skulls were switched, he chopped off Linny's feet and hands so no one else could get them. They buried Lanny up by the church and set a guard on watch. Only they got drunk and another mob came in and dug up what was left of him. In the morning, the teacher's skull was lying in the dirt. What a sad and sorry tale. And there he stands, up there on his stone pillar, Mr. Crowther, all puffed up, acting the hero. But don't let that be what you remember of Lanny. He loved his country, the western lands, the deep forests and grasslands. And the wild shores. Still there today. Still beautiful. Bye bye, William. That's my story, and I'll say no more. Good day, dear.